I will introduce you. So uh, welcome back everyone for the second talk of the afternoon today. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Kate Ponto from the University of Kentucky, who will talk about traces from K-theory and zeta functions. Well, well, thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. As I was saying, I wish I was actually literally in Barcelona. Um, the last time I was there, I had a wonderful time both at the conference and just wandering the city. And so uh, I, have, I have fond feelings, but instead I'm sitting in my guest room in Lexington, Kentucky, which, you know, a nice place to be to, but not quite the same. <laughs> So what I wanna talk about today is um, traces with domain and algebraic K-theory. And I wanna to try to combine two very different stories. I mean, in some sense, they're really not very different stories, um, but they sort of feel different and they sort of evolve separately. So I wanna take two ideas that started out their lives together and then sort of each had their own future and then came back together. And, and I wanna start um, with the kind of questions that often motivate me, which are ideas coming from topological fixed point theory. And so I want to talk about some topology to get us started. And I mostly want to remind us of topology that's probably in your brain, and then maybe give you some that's not quite there. And then we'll switch gears and trace another development of these same ideas. So let's start with Euler characteristic. So we tend to think about um, Euler characteristic as being a thing that starts out at finite CW complexes and goes to the integers. Um, there's nothing wrong with this as I stated it, but um, being a good invariant, it doesn't care about homeomorphism. So I can look at finite CW complexes up to homeomorphism. And yeah, because Euler characteristic is sort of sane, um, we're gonna actually factor like this. And then one more thing I want to say is that Euler characteristic has, oh, there's a can question. For a minute? Um, well, oh, now we can see it. We just couldn't see what you were writing. Maybe it oh. was a long time to update. Oh, mm -hmm. weird. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me know if that happens again. Yeah, it, we'll do. It needed Dave to, to, David to interrupt and then it appeared. Yeah. Now it's all better. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're looking at finite CW complexes and we're saying Euler characteristic is a reasonable invariant and so it doesn't care about homeomorphism. And even better, Euler characteristic is additive on subcomplexes. So I'm gonna look at finite CW complexes up to homeomorphism. And I'm gonna say that A plus X mod A is equal to X for A contained in X. I actually get a map here too. So all I'm just saying here is that one of the sort of fundamental properties of Euler characteristic is that it is, it is reasonable, um, both in the sense that it's um, defined up to homeomorphism, and it's even better than that, it has the property that um, if you can decompose your space into pieces, you can reconstruct the Euler characteristic from all the pieces. Um, this actually characterizes the Euler characteristic, which is not going to be true of the next invariants I talk about, but for these guys, it actually does characterize the Euler characteristic. Okay, so Next on my list is a sort of slightly fancying up of this. And that is, I wanna look at the Lefschetz number. So I wanna move from finite TW complexes to their endomorphisms. We'll look at endomorphisms of finite TW complexes. And I still have a map to the integers, which takes my, I'm gonna call it L and L of F is the sum minus one to the i, the trace Not of the visible integers. again. It's doing it, it's lagging again. Let's see. Come on now, uh, come on now. What are you doing computer? Let's see. All right, seems to be, let's see if I can actually detect it on my end. So it looks fine on my end. What's going on there, everybody else? We can see it at the moment. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll see if I can detect the discrepancy here too. All right, so this is, um, this is an, a totally reasonable generalization of the Euler characteristic. And if I look at um, the identity map, I, if I look at the Lefschetz number of the identity map, I in fact get the Euler characteristic. And just like before, this is compatible with homeomorphism. Let me just copy and paste. 
So I'm going to look at this uh, homeomorphism. And in this case, I mean homeomorphisms of my um, endomorphism. So I mean commuting diagrams where I have x to y and I have endomorphisms of x and y. So I have squares like this. And I get an induced map here. And one of the really great features about the Lefschetz number, which sort of besides its sort of similarity and definition, is that it also has the required um, compatibility with um, subcomplexes. So if we look at, if I copy over again, and I look at homeomorphism, and I look at um, a into x, into x mod a, and I look at f restricted to a, which happens to end, end up in a, so otherwise this isn't going to make sense, fx, x mod a, then we do in fact have the Lefschetz number of f is the Lefschetz number of f restricted to a plus the Lefschetz number of f mod a. So we get to have the same exact setup that we had before. Now it's gonna turn out that these are not the only um, motivating invariants. And so I wanna, um, I wanna move one step further. I wanna introduce another um, invariant from topological fixed point theory that's maybe less familiar. Um, it's known as either the generalized Lefschetz number or the Reitermeister trace. And our setup is we're gonna start with an endomorphism. And then I'm going to, I'm going to do a couple of things that are going to be kind of annoying, but they're going to be okay. I'm going to look at the induced map on the universal cover. And I'm going to remember that this space has an action of the fundamental group. Now I'm probably making some horrendous choices about base points, but I'm not going to labor over that. Um, so know that there's some base pointness happening here. There are better solutions, but they require um, more vocabulary. And so I'm not going to go into that. Um, but know that I'm hiding something here, but I'm making some terrible base point choices. Now, as written, um, this map is not actually equivariant with respect to the pi one of x action. So what I need to do is I need to twist the action, which I'm going to indicate with this subscript here. So this just means that I've twisted the action um, of pi one of x on x tilde. That way the map is actually a variant. And it's a really silly thing to do, um, but it's absolutely necessary. Um, and so this is just non-negotiable, but annoying. OK, so it turns out that if you remember the action of pi one, and your x that you start out with is finitely gen is a, a, fi a finite CW complex, then the rational homology, not rational homology, the rational chain complex, I'm saying using cellular chains. So let me write this down. So if x is a finite CW complex, um, C star of x tilde with coefficients in Q is a Let's use Z in fact here, is a um, finitely generated free Z pi one of X module. So it inherits a reasonable notion of, of finite and freeness from the space X that we started out with. And what that means is that I can talk about trace just like I did for the Lefschetz number. But this trace is a little bit less familiar, um, or maybe maybe it's not, maybe it's getting to be more familiar. I sort of hope so. Um, and so let me define how this thing, how this, how this trace works. So first I'm gonna take the integers and I'm gonna map them in to, well, the maps from this, chain complex to itself where I've twisted the action 
on the target. So this just takes one and picks out my F tilde. Now I very carefully labored over the finite generation here. And that's just because I wanna be able to rewrite this. And I have a natural map that happens to be an isomorphism in the case I care about. In the case I care about, I can pull off and write the hom z pi one of x, c star, x tilde, z, z pi one of x, tensor c star, x tilde f star of z. Now this is the sort of familiar map that um, takes a hom from um, the module m down to the ground ring tensor the module itself to hom mm. Um, except I have a little bit of a, a change here. I have my twisting. And I'm going to actually slide that twisting over and I'm going to instead put it here. Um, it just is, I'm just rewriting this, um, this chain complex to record the twisting in a different place. Um, but it's still the same exact twisting and the, the modules or the chain complexes themselves are isomorphic. But now that I'm here, I can evaluate. Uh, one thing I should write is I should tell you what this tensor is. This tensor is over z pi one of x. And that's gonna be annoying because it means that I'm not actually gonna end up in this z pi one of x sub f. I'm gonna end up in the zeroth Hochschild homology of it. So when I evaluate, I'm gonna end up in the zero Hochschild homology, z pi one of x with coefficients in z pi one of x, f star. So what this is, is um, it is z pi one of x, where I have forcibly identified, um, let's just use gamma and delta with um, f star, right the other direction, delta f star of gamma. This is extremely destructive. Um, you may really, really dislike this. And I don't know what to tell you besides this is what the math does. Um, the math is utterly unwilling to do anything else. It, it does this. And so we, we go with it. We, we trust it, that this is what it's gonna do. All right, so I'm gonna just accept this. So this is an example of the Hattori Stallings trace. Um, and it's, it's really fundamental in topological fixed point theory. This composite from start to end here that goes from one all the way across to here um, is what's used to define the Nielsen number, which provides um, a converse, partial converse to the left of fixed point theorem. But this is the trace that I'm really interested in. And this trace is additive if interpreted correctly. So um, if I look at the same setup as above, let me just copy that over. The same setup here as before, what we do have is we do have that um, R of F restricted to A plus R of F mod A is equal to R of F. There's a little bit of a problem here. These things actually live in different groups. So what I need to do is I need to force these two to live in the same group as this guy. And I just use um, an inclusion there. So that's as annoying, but it is in fact additive in exactly the same way. So we have this whole series of um, invariants that are additive and that's sort of fundamental to why they're nice invariants. Um, and so we want to exploit that. So this is sort of one half of the story. Now, the other half of the story that sort of happened separately was people got really interested in algebraic K theory um, because algebraic K theory is the domain of functions or of invariants that are reasonable, that are computable. And so what happened is there were sort of these very independent developments. Um, fixed point theory sort of did its own thing for a very long time and separately um, algebraic K theory sort of did its own thing. And one of the major um, strands in um, computations for algebraic K theory were in these trace methods, which approximate algebraic K theory by other groups. Um, and 
what I want to talk about today is a comparison of how those two things can come back together after they sort of diverged over the years. How do they actually reconverge? Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, the algebraic side of this. So I'm going to just fix some notation. So I'm going to let, in just contradiction to what I had before, I'm going to let A be a ring. It doesn't have to be commutative. Um, in the context I just described, my ring of choice is often z pi 1 of x, which is definitely not commutative. Um, but it could be commutative. It doesn't have to be. And I'm going to let P upper A be the category of finitely generated projective A modules. All right. So I want to play a bunch of different games here. I want, to, I want to sort of do two different real setups here. So the first thing I want to do is I want to take my um, P upper A, which has a, has a sum. I can add modules. And I preserve the finitely generated projectiveness. And I want to turn that into a group. So I want to take P of A, recognize this as a monoid. And I want to turn it into a group. Right? This is the thing we do when we're defining K theory. All right. And right now, I just want to work in sort of the most minimal sense of K theory, right? I don't want to do anything fancy at this point. Um, I'm not even going to really need to do anything super fancy later. I just want to say, okay, I'm taking sums. I'm making sums really, really central. And I'm turning my sum actually from a monoid operation to a group operation. Now, I want to do another sort of unre what seems superficially unrelated thing is I want to take the sum over all objects of P of A. And I want to look at the endomorphisms of those objects. So I want to take um, the endomorphisms of X and I want to sum all of those over all X. And now I want to create, again, mass destruction motivated by the mass destruction I just imposed above. I want to now impose that if I take an endomorphism, which I factor through Y, I want to forcibly identify that with the same thing where I compose the maps in the other order. So on the one hand, I've taken my monoid operation and I've made it a group operation. On the other hand, I'm taking my category and I'm saying, I don't care where the morphism starts and ends, this endomorphism. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that any place I can break the, an endomorphism and then recompose in the other order, that's gonna be the same as what I started with. So I'm gonna use the notation here PA mod bracket PAA uh, motivated by the, the, motiv the notation from group theory. Um, and it's, it's coming from this Hochschild homology motivation too. So I will also indicate this with HH0 of P of A. It's gonna be a, a certain amount of, of shifting between these two things. So I'm taking the category of finitely generated projective A modules and I'm sort of doing two sorts of damage to it. Um, one is maybe um, more familiar. It's more obvious for when I'm talking about additive invariance, why I would do that. The other is sort of familiar from other motivations. All right. So, ah, yeah, so just, just to fix the notation um, and to make it sort of consistent, if my, my ring A, I will write the same notation A mod the square brackets to mean A where I forcibly identify A times B with B times A which again, I will also write as HH0 of A. So now I want to build a diagram. It's a very small diagram. I'm going to take P of A and I'm going to force A plus B to be A plus B. And I can first map this into my P of A mod P of A, P of A. This is just going to take my um, module and think about it as its endomorphic, as, as endomorphisms. And I can also go down to the A, A mod A. Um, this is the refinement of the Lapschitz number. to the right of Meister trace. 
Because notice that definition I gave you was specific to the chain complex on the universal cover of a space. That was unnecessarily restrictive in general. Like I wanted to, to build the comparison to the Lefkowitz number there, but in general, this makes sense for any endomorphism of any finitely generated projective module. The same setup exactly works. So on the top, I have sort of an inclusion map. On the bottom, I have, um, well, not an inclusion map. I have a thing that looks like a very sort of linear algebraic trace across the bottom. And there is in fact a map that goes from the bottom to the top, a really dumb map. Um, I mean, I feel like that's extremely judgy of that map, but that map really just is regard A as a module over itself. Um, this map actually turns out to, well, this is, there's Marita equivalents hanging out here. So really, there's no distinction between these two things, which gives you a sense of how incredibly destructive this relationship of the, the sort of cyclic invariance relationship is, is throughout this. All right, so this is my, my sort of setup here. Uh, across the top, we have um, a map that was primarily designed to enable computations in algebraic K theory. All right, that's what that map is designed to do. Um, it is designed to help you figure out what K theory is. The map across the bottom has a very different narrative behind it, um, at least from my perspective. Um, this is a thing that you can do to endomorphisms. Um, and it's a useful and important thing to do to endomorphisms. And so these two things sort of evolved separately. And these are the things that I wanna draw back together. I wanna to tell you a little bit more about how they evolved. And then I wanna tell you about how they come back together. So for the top arrow, so let's throw so. So where, what its history did was we replaced um, our P of A made a group by the K-theory spectrum. And this funny quotient by Hochschild homology, not just HH0, but all of it, or THH. So its narrative is all about um, how can I refine this map? How can I make it more interesting? How can I make it carry more structure? How can I make both sides more interesting? How can I make them closer together? Um, oh, we can also replace this target by TH, TR, which is another thing that sits between K-theory and THH. It's a further refinement of THH to carry more structure. Um, and the goal here is to define a map of spectra that goes between K-theory and say TR or THH. So we want a map Now, a lot of people have thought very, very hard about how to do this. And what I'm interested in is a very particular description of this map. And I'm going to focus on one very specific approach that really prioritizes some simple properties of THH um, or Hochschild homology. So I'm gonna really come back to one particular idea over and over again, but keep in mind that there's many options for how to think about this map and how to talk about this map. Um, but I'm gonna really focus on one in particular because I am interested in selling you on the importance of one basic property. Um, and that's what I really am as an ad for one basic property. The other thing is I need to tell you just briefly that um, K-theory and THH have, actually have sort of different kinds of input. Um, they sort of want different things to be fed to them. Um, I'm gonna ask for sort of a, a sort of minimal notion of compatibility. Um, so I'm gonna want my, I'm gonna focus on K-theory defined using Waldhausen categories, which are categories with a notion of co-vibration. Um, and my THH is gonna wanna eat a category enriched in spectra or some sort of algebraic analog. I want a very minimal compatibility between them. So that exactly what that compatibility is, is not actually important. Um, I just need some sort of very minimal compatibility. Um, my goal here at sort of every stage is to use sort of the minimum I can to get at the results I want because there's enough going on. All right. Um, now for the bottom arrow, we're gonna pry, ugh. We will prioritize 
the finiteness property of the objects, by which I mean the, the things we're taking endomorphisms of. So I'm really prioritizing um, those guys specifically. Right? I'm looking at the, the finiteness there. And I wanna know what I can sort of say about what's happening in this case. And there I wanted to find a map, to define a map from pi zero of K, which is still K zero to pi zero of TR to pi zero of THH. So this is sort of naturally gonna define a map on homotopy groups. So on the one hand, we have the sort of truly spectral level generalization. Now I want to talk about something on this side that sort of parallels the bottom arrow um, that is going to define on objects is going to more naturally define on homotopy groups. Parenthetically, the fact that I'm talking about pi zero here is just an artifact of what math has been done so far. Um, this approach should really like to do things for higher homotopy groups too. Um, that math just hasn't been done yet. Um, but there are strong indications of how that should actually work. All right. So I'm going to call the first of these um, the Dennis approach. This is usually called the Dennis trace. And the second one, the bicategorical. Um, and then the, the first theorem, which is sort of not a surprise because it really just is the things we sort of expect. Um, and this is due to, I guess I should have said this at the beginning, this is all part of a collaboration with um, Jonathan Campbell, John Lind, Kerry Melkiewicz, um, myself, and Ina Zakharevich. So I'm not going to write all those names out. I'm going to abbreviate. <laughs> um, and I'm going to state this theorem extremely minimally. I'm going to tell you that, in fact, yep, when we sort of fancy up everybody, and then we look at pi naught of the Dennis trace, we get the bicategorical trace. So this is not a shocker. Um, this is sort of what it absolutely should be happening um, based on sort of everybody's motivation for what's happening here. Um, but this is sort of the first thing I wanna put in your brain that this sort of Dennis trace that really evolved to um, solve this computational problem actually matches the sort of initial motivation really, really well and really pretty straightforwardly. So I'm gonna talk mostly about this result and what goes forward after this, but I do want to, um, I want to state two more um, simply because the proofs are the same. They're just notationally more annoying. And so I'm gonna talk primarily about this result because the, it captures the fundamental ideas. Um, and then we can you know, come back to the other ones later. Now to do this, I need to, I need to talk just a little bit more about the objects in question. So let's go back to that, that trace example that we were talking about. So I'm gonna have, I have A is a ring, P is a finitely generated projective A module, and M is an AA phi module. So the operation I described before, what it does is it's going to take Z into HOM over A, P, M tensor over A, P, where I'm going to take my one just to sum map phi from M, no, P to M tensor P. And then I'm going to use that same exact isomorphism as before to get myself to palm over A, P, A, tensor over A, M, tensor over A with P. And then I'm gonna map down to HH zero of A with coefficients in it. So this is the same map as before. I'm just writing it down um, with the sort of case I care about. And the reason I'm doing that is because I now want to find another map from this phi. And I'm sorry about this notation. I haven't come up with a better choice. I'm going to write phi circle n. Now, phi doesn't actually compose, right, because its source doesn't match its target. But what I can do is I can take p into 
M tensor over AP. And I can map that via the identity tensor phi to M tensor over A with M tensor over A with P. And I can repeat this. And I'm going to call that phi circle N because I don't have a better notation for it, but I don't especially like it. And I am, yeah, I am sorry, but that's the way we got it. All right, so this is another thing I can take a trace of. This has a slightly more complicated target, right? It has a more interesting option. Um, and the, what's going to happen here is it's actually going to give you an invariant that takes values in topological restriction homology. So the next theorem that I just want to want to set up is from the same collaboration, same paper, says that the bicategorical trace of this thing is what happens on pi naught of a lift of the Dennis trace where this Dennis tilde is a lift of Dennis to TR. So again, this Dennis tilde was designed to give us computational control over algebraic K theory. It was not designed for its um, great transparency, I guess is the right way to say it. Um, maybe that's a little bit harsh, but um, that is not what it was designed for in my mind. Okay, so this is saying that the same narrative of you build a sort of computational tool to understand algebraic K theory and you can compare it to this very sort of reasonable generalization, very standard idea of how to move from the trace of a matrix and you still get comparisons that work. And there's one more theorem which I wanna just sort of put out there. Again, I'm not gonna spend big time on it because it really does follow from this guy and it's very similar in spirit to the one above. And that is telling you again, a sort of fact we definitely want to be true, and that is if A is a discrete commutative ring, and we look at what happens on the zero um, K theory, and I'm taking reduce because I just don't want to have extra junk hanging around in my K theory. Well, I can map down to zero, K pi zero of TR of A, and that's going to be the same thing as, well, I'm going to take some power series. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send my endomorphism to the determinant of one minus T times F. So really what I'm doing here is I'm picking out the characteristic polynomial. And this is morally what should be happening, I think. I think um, nobody's shocked by this. Um, this is sort of firmly in the category of, yeah, that really should be how things go. That's really what should be going on here. Okay. So what I wanna do now is give you more of a sense of what's actually going on behind the scenes. And I wanna make more of a case for the sort of centrality of this object right here. I mean, I've sort of already made an argument for the centrality of this object. So maybe a better way to say it is I wanna make an argument for the power of this condition. Um, this is somehow going to be the thing that really moves everything. And it's gonna move everything on both sides of this comparison in these theorems. It is central to both how we talk about the Dennis approach to the trace and how we talk about the bicategorical approach to the trace. They're both really fundamentally built on the same things. So I'm now gonna make a, a shift where I'm gonna really sort of aggressively use the idea that a category enriched in say abelian groups or in spectra really should be thought of as a ring with many objects. And that a functor from that, that category tensor, it's opposite down to your enriching category should be thought of as a module. So if you really wanna think about just rings and modules, you can absolutely do that. Just every time I have a category, just shove in a ring. And every time I have a functor of, that sort of takes these two things as inputs, just shove in that module. So here I'm gonna say C is a V enriched category.
And I'm not going to really worry about what V is. I'm really thinking of spectra, but I also sort of, when I need to get myself more, more sort of focused, I think about a billion groups. And I'm going to take X to be a functor from C cross C up to whatever my origin category is. So yeah, so remember rings with many objects is the motivating example here. And what I want to look at is the cyclic bar construction. This is sort of a really amazing object that is going to sort of encode all the structure we care about here. Um, that's a little strong. It's going to encode a lot of the structure we care about here. <laughs> so we're going to look at this um, cyclic bar construction for C with coefficients in X. And in keeping with my philosophy that V is spectra, I'm going to write um, wedge and smash as my ways of combining objects, but you could write tensor and plus if you wanted. So I'm gonna take the wedge over tuples, C0 up to Cn. Uh, script C, C0, C1, smash, script C, C1, C2, smash, smash up to um, script C, Cn minus one, Cn. I'm gonna slide that over smash x c n c zero. Now this has a whole bunch of structure. Most notably, it has a bunch of multiplications. So when I look at, um, or compositions in this case. So when I look at um, script c zero, script, script c zero c one, and then the c that follows it, I can compose those to drop my number of c's by one. Um, I can also act by this last copy of c on x. And I can also act by the first copy of C on X. So this is gonna give me a simplicial structure. I can also include identities if I want. Um, that just sort of is necessary, but less exciting to me. Uh, and then we're gonna say, so I'm gonna use the, the construction of THH where I make whatever necessary assumptions I need to, to treat the geometric realization of this guy is my THH of C. So this is the derived version of the HH0, which I was using previously, which sort of maybe doesn't surprise anyone that that's going to make another appearance. Um, it's also really, really closely related to the derived tensor product. Um, I feel like saying really closely related sort of undersells the connection. Um, it really is the derived tensor product where we tensor sort of over the two actions on the outside of a ring, of our module. So it's, it's I, I need to convey that, that this is somehow the same structure. It's sort of part of the same information. And the thing that's gonna really matter here, the thing that's actually gonna carry sort of basically all the structure is that there is an isomorphism from the geometric realization of the cyclic bar construction of C where I plug in say X tensor Y over D. So I'm using tensor product of functors here. So in this setting, um, X goes from C cross D up to V and Y is gonna go from D up cross C to V. So really I'm thinking about say a CD by module and a DC by module and I'm tensoring them over D and I'm tensoring over the outside over C. To the same thing, except I'm gonna change the order. Um, and I'm gonna put the D on the outside and the C on the inside. Um, but in my head, there's really a picture here, which is I have my C and my D and I have my X and my Y and my Y has a C end and a D end and my X is a C end and a D end and I can tie the C's together or I can tie the D's together and it doesn't actually matter which order I tie them together in. Um, that's what this is saying. Um, this fact is like the key fact um, this is sort of weirdly the thing that is going to matter all the time. So really just come back to this idea over and over and over again. Like I, I, I don't know how to say how central this is any more than just say over and over again, this is the key fact about 
about topological Hochschild homology. Um, topological restriction homology has a similar property, um, which is why this is all going to sort of work out the same way, because I'm going to basically now be able to almost entirely punt on what the construction is and just work from this definition or work from this property, which is delightful. It's just delightful. It makes our lives so much easier. Okay, um, I also want to observe something that's that's important, but a little bit less exciting. Um, and that is that there is a map where if I just look at Oops. X C zero C zero. I can map that into my T H H uh, C with coefficients of X. Like that's um, yeah, that's not exciting. I just map that in because this lives at the bottom of my simplicial structure. I'm just going to shove it in there. All right. So I have two things. I have this cyclic property. And I have that I can map in the endomorphisms. And that's going to be sort of most of what I care about. Um, that's basically the whole setup here. OK, so now I've got this guy. And I want to talk about, um, I want to talk briefly about a result of Blumberg and Mandel, um, just because I need to sort of set up how I want to define my map. Um, and then I want to, then I'm going to actually use it to describe how, to, to describe how we're thinking about the Dennis construction of the trace. Okay, so if I have a Waldhausen category, so remember this is a category C where there's a notion of co-fibration. Um, and then I'm gonna be able to keep track of quotients. I'm gonna look at S sub N of C, which is gonna be nerve of the category whose objects, well, they look like just strings of objects. And we have quotients, A i j, which is going to be A zero j, my A zero i. So what I'm doing is I'm setting up a series of uh, basically exact sequences. I'm thinking about them or quotients. I'm harping back to the additivity we had at the beginning of the conversation. All right, I'm going back to that again. Um, but I want to build big connection, big collections of them, right? Big, huge collections of them. And the theorem of Blumberg and Mandel, oh, and maps of these are just maps of the diagrams. Um, so those, and let me just write that down. So the theorem of Blumberg and Mandel tells me that THH is kind of oblivious to this construction. So the theorem says that THH, well, let's write it as a wedge. Let's write it this way. The wedge over J equals one to K of THH of C maps into THH of SK of C and this is actually an equivalence. So I don't know, I tend to think of, end up thinking about THH as sort of um, dense. <laughs> and THH doesn't actually care about this, this S K of C. Like it, it doesn't really see this S dot construction. It says, fine, that looks like a whole bunch of copies of C guys. And this is a really powerful fact about THH. And this actually also comes from that same cyclic invariance. So this, this comes from the same property way up here. Well, nope, I went right by it. It comes from the same isomorphism right here. So this is why THH is sort of oblivious to the construct, the S dot construction. And that's a sort of fundamental, really useful observation that it just can't tell. And that's gonna be what we need to do. So the other thing I should say just briefly is that the S dot construction can be iterated to produce sort of not just a single direction, but like multiple directions. Um, and also this wedge is happening over many copies of the same thing. So I can replace it with a circle. So I can replace this with S dot or the circle, the simplicial circle smashed on times 
smash with THH of C down to THH WK. This is just doing that same construction, but with weak equivalences. So I'm just repeating that same sort of idea over and over again. All right, so we've got, we've done almost all the work now for the, the dentist trace, which is, which is good because um, I've been going for about 45 minutes now. And so we need to get back to the other side a little bit. Okay, so let's just say a little bit more. So let's go back to this, this very silly map I described. I described this extremely silly map it's a very nice map. This is going to give us a lot of a lot of power here, and so I can take my objects of my endomorphisms of C zero. Now, what do I mean by C zero here? I mean a category where I've stripped away whatever sort of simple whatever sort of spectral or um, abelian group enrichment, and I'm just recording sort of a Waldhausen structure, and I'm going to map that into a wedge over the objects of C0 of the script C category. And I'm going to take that into THH of C. So I have script C and script C sub zero. The discrepancy here is that C0 remembers a Waldhausen structure and C is the sort of spectral analog. And again, I'm looking for sort of a minimal level of compatibility. Really, I want them to agree on objects and I want the suspension spectra of the, mo of the, the HOM sets on the C0 side to be the HOM sets on the C side but you can get by with a little bit less. All right, so I'm gonna do something um, really, you know, just sitting there waiting for us. I'm gonna plug in this, this THH input into this map I've just defined. So I'm gonna look at objects end of WK0, SK1, SKN. Whoa, there's an extra S there. Of C. I'm going to map that into my THH of WK0, SK1, KN of C. And then I'm going to use the fact that I can take that down to my S1 smash N times with THHFC. And again, I want to reiterate that the thing that's sort of central here is the cyclic invariance. That's the thing I really, really want to understand. That's the thing that's actually giving me power here. Um, the cyclic invariance is the thing that's actually helping me. Um, because it's, it's sort of an unsophisticated, extremely destructive um, assumption that's giving me an, the map I actually need and this is the description I want to use of the dentist trace. This is the description I actually want to use. So this is my version of the dentist trace. So we got there. And so now I want to come back and pick up the other strand. I want to pick up the strand um, from the, the bicategorical trace. And I guess I'm going to pick that up in my last 10 minutes here. So let's take just a second to look at what this map right here does on pi zero. So, so on pi zero, well, I'm going to look at a map from the sphere into my C, C zero, C zero. And it's going to send, well, it's going to just pick out a map from C zero to C zero. That's what this map is going to do. So it's just going to pick out an element there. And then we're going to map into a wedge over C in script C, C, C. And then we're going to map down to THHFC. And that's all this is doing. So we've given this extremely, like almost painfully explicit description, and we can just check what's happening on pi zero. We can just look and see, ah, this is indeed what it does, is it just does this. OK, so that looks promising. But remember, we've moved to the sort of extremely sort of general case of our category C. And so I want to pull things back just a little bit um, to the category of modules I was thinking about at the beginning. So let's look at when C is equal to the finally generated projective modules over A. So 
in this case, what we really are looking at, so in this case, we think of the dentist trace as the composite pi zero k of a pi zero thh pa because that's what this guy really is a of pa and then we use the map, this equivalence that we had to get ourselves back down to pi zero THH of A. So it turns out that at the end of the day, the work we need to do is actually in this last identification. So we can use the sort of same ideas that have been percolating for a long time, right, to refine these ideas of Blumberg, Vendel, and others to get our map into THH of P of A. And now the question is, we really need to get back ourselves back down to THH of A is where we want to end up. So the last little piece of this theorem that, I, that I'm sort of focusing on today is just what is going on with this identification? What's happening in this very last piece? And this is where I really, again, want to sort of change directions. And I want to go back to the, the bicategorical approach that I was talking about before. And for this, I want to... Um, I want to sort of just state this as a separate theorem. And this is due to myself and Jonathan Campbell. And it says that the image of the class of F and pi one of THH of PA under the map THH of PA to THH of A. Remember, this map naturally, we, it's easiest to define in the other direction. Um, so we tend to think about it as the given by the inclusion, but I want to think about what happens the other way. Because here I'm thinking of F as an element of P of A, which I'm identifying with an element in THH of, a, P of A by inclusion. And I'm mapping it down under the map is the bicategorical trace of F. So what I want to say here is I want to say that I actually have good control. I know what's happening on this map in the other direction. All right. So that's going to give me the identification that I actually need. All right. I'm going to say, well, I can, I can really use the structure of THH and the cyclicity to give a nice, relatively concise description of the map to THH of P of, P of A. And then I'm going to strip off that last piece and handle that last piece separately. All right, so this is now going to be a very different flavor. So we did sort of a very um, more familiar K-theoretic flavor, and now we're gonna switch to a very bicategorical flavor um, just to sort of move between them here. Oh, again, this is, a, this is a, a pi zero statement by like time constraints um, of the math. Not, I haven't actually figured out what I should say in the general case here, but I think the math does not actually care about pi zero. Okay, so it's going to turn out that this statement is easier to keep track of if I move from, say, just an A module to an AB by module, just because it's easier if both of my rings in question are interesting. Um, when I'm talking about an A module, I have a Z actually acting on the other side, but it's easier if I make that very explicit. So I'm going to say that M here is a finitely generated projective. A, B, by module. I actually only need um, the finite generated projective with respect to one of the rings. I'm going to state it as if it's, it's overkill, but I really just need it for one of the rings. And you're going to see that because I'm going to revisit that same definition we've had before. So as before, and I'm only going to look at um, endomorphisms of M without that additional module stuck on. I also just realized I switched from M being the finitely generated projective module from P earlier. I am, I am sorry. <laughs> All right, so we're sitting up here. So I can look at um, say over B from M to M. And I can pick out 
in there a module fee by using by mapping the A itself in. And this is just going to pick out that module fee. I'm going to end up with uh, B tensor over B of M. So this, um, the map I keep coming back to, this HOM B from M to B tensor over B with M, that's still an isomorphism. Right, that hasn't that hasn't changed. So this is the direction I need finally generated projected for. And now I want to evaluate, and I have the same problem I've been having all along, um, because I always have that same problem, and I'm going to fix it the same way I always have, which is going to be use that same cyclicity. So I'm going to impose um, a Hochschild homology on everybody. And I could impose a, a topological Hochschild homology on everybody. That would be completely fine. But once I do that, the evaluation is now defined. And so I can get a map um, to B. So this is going to give me a map from, um, if I start out with a map from M to M, I'm going to get a map from the Hochschild homology of A to the Hochschild homology of B. This is the same map we've now seen three times. Um, I'm just going to keep doing it in, in greater and greater generality. Um, but there we go. All right, so there's another sort of very similar map I can define here, um, which is I can look at this map phi and I can define a map and the module M and I can define a map from, first of all, from A modules to B modules, which is gonna send a module P, let's call it N, to, um, M tensor over A with N. Nope, other order. N tensor over A with M. So that's a, a thing I can do. That defines a map from one category to the other. Um, and I can define um, a map too. I can also look at, um, and I can do the same. by tensoring with phi. So I can do the same exact kind of setup. I can define a map there too. All right. Now, one thing that this does for me is it defines a map from HH0 of PA to HH0 of PB. And all it is, is just use this map that we've defined right here, just go. Like if I have an endomorphism um, from N to itself, I'm just gonna tensor that endomorphism with, with phi. It turns out that if I use the, um, the rings with many objects perspective, this map is just a trace. So this is HH of F tensor. And it turns out that this is a trace of somebody. So this can be understood as a trace, meaning exactly the same composite as we have up here, where I just replaced my rings by rings with many objects, i.e. categories, and my modules by functors. Okay. So then I have two more things I can do, which you're very much on to me now with these because we've seen them before. I can also look at including HHA into HH of PA and HH of B into HH of PB. And these are again, just inclusions. They're just induced by the inclusion of A into PAA regarding those elements of A as endomorphisms of the module A. And more importantly, these are also understood as traces. Now I feel like this is seeming maybe a little opaque right now because I'm like, they're magically traces. They're just like before. And you're like, but who is my module? And your module is actually just A itself, right? It's just your, your unit for the tensor product or B itself. And you're taking a trace with respect to that. So you're taking a trace with respect to a really dumb module, 
and the trace ends up not being interesting. All right, so this is a thing that we're familiar with. If we think about what happens in linear algebra, if we take the trace of um, the vector space and endomorphism of the ground field, we just get that endomorphism back again. Um, that's exactly what's happening here. And so then the theorem rephrased, so this same theorem from up here, but rephrased becomes that if we have A over to B, and this is the trace of phi, and I map down, oops, I'm switching notation. Let's go with the HHA notation, HH notation. And here I have HH of B tensor something, and these are both inclusion or induced by the inclusion. The theorem is that this commutes. And there's two things I wanna say about this. Um, the first is that um, this recovers what we were seeing before. If we just take A to B, say the integers, then this is just picking out something in HH of B and in HH of P of B. And so this is exactly what we saw before. I find it less confusing when I don't have a lot of um, unit E things running around. Um, so that's a, a real bonus for me. That's why I stated this in this greater generality. So you can see inside of this, you can see that this is indeed taking the trace to what is induced by the, on the Hochschild homology by tensoring with B. The other thing I wanna say is that this statement right here is almost entirely formal. So while I was talking earlier about, um, I have these very sort of explicit, um, I'm gonna build this nerve and I'm gonna include here, this statement has a very, very different proof. Um, the sort of key observation here is that all arrows in this diagram are traces. And then there's what is probably my favorite result in this field, which is that um, a composite of traces is the trace of the composite. So what you're actually gonna do is you're gonna compare the underlying maps that, in, that are, are defining all these traces. And you're gonna see that on underlying maps, these things just agree. Like there's nothing particularly mysterious happening. There's nothing opaque. The work is really just in seeing that these traces do in fact come from the same original map. The composites are the, are, are the same. It's just an or, a question of when did you do your inclusion and when did you apply fee? So this actually takes us back to the very beginning now, because now we've identified what's happening across that comparison. Um, we've figured out what's going on with that comparison from Hochschild homology of A into Hochschild homology of P of A. So this argument really splits into two pieces. There's this very sort of um, bicategorical argument here at the end. At the beginning, it's sort of like, let us recognize what's happening with the dentist trace. Let's see how that inclusion is working and just carry that through. All right, so I'm gonna stop here um, because that is basically what I wanted to say. All right, uh, thanks Kate for the great talk. Um, are there any questions? Hey Kate. Yeah. Uh, so this this theorem, uh, this last one that you stated, that's not not on uh, pi zero, that's just like it no, commutes. That's not on pi zero, nope, nope. There's a real discrepancy. This one is, um, this, was an ex this is extremely formal. Um, and this in fact appears in a different paper. This does not appear in the, the five author paper. This appears in the, the first paper with Jonathan. But yeah, this is not a pi zero statement. This is a everywhere statement. So the, the pi zero stuff comes from when you're trying to compare the bicategorical picture to what's yep. happening with the Dennis trace. Um, yep, yep. Okay. Okay. And I think that's largely an artifact of exhaustion Right, I don't think it's an artifact of the math. I think it's like a like we finished that paper during the beginning of COVID. Um, I definitely had many conversations with Ina where she was like, "I am angry at the world, so I will fight with this paper." Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of that really should be pi zero. It's written to be pi zero because we needed that paper to, you know, we needed to get a version of that paper out for both to communicate the ideas and for our, our own sanity. Thanks. I mean, this one definitely is not. And this is also just a ridiculously special case of a general statement. 
just about your last uh, commutative diagram. Yeah. Is the Dennis trace uh, sitting somewhere in the diagram or adjacent to it? So the Dennis trace is actually adjacent to it. It's coming in from below here. So it would be coming in from below. Right, okay. So mm -hmm. it'll be coming in at both ends yeah. from below. Yeah. Uh, and then is the Dennis trace, is there a link between the Dennis trace then as well? Yeah, so, so this one was not set up in this generality. So this is, this is, so I set up the Dennis trace only in the generality of a single ring. And here I'm talking about two, just as sort of a, a cosmetic thing, um, but it really shouldn't care. It should just carry through with the functoriality um, up at the beginning, I would think. I honestly no, haven't no. thought about that. Well, what I'm alluding to is there could be uh, another map between the two Dennis yeah. traces as well. Yeah, and I think you're saying something like this. Yes. Uh, yes. And is, is there? I mean, is that well known or is that discovered? Um, I think it should just carry through all the constructions, but I would have to think about it a little bit. And I honestly haven't. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I have a question. Um, yeah. you meant, so endomorphisms came up pretty frequently. In yes. Um, you had a calculation of, um, well, TR came up, or at least it's pi zero. Mm -hmm. um, what about a potentially sitting in between object, which is the K theory of endomorphisms? So yes, so this map, so this whole conversation really actually has its domain in K theory of endomorphisms. So that was definitely a thing that got suppressed for sure. So one of the sort of underlying ideas here is that when you when you prioritize when you when you can't not see by categorical traces. You just can't not see them. You really think that the Dennis trace's domain should naturally be K-theory of endomorphisms. And so that is really another sort of slogan in this paper is that the Dennis trace really its honest domain is actually K-theory of endomorphisms and we're just going to conclude K of A in there because well, that's a good way to get, you know, what's happening at K of A, which is the thing that we sort of want because of, because of its computational power. But yes, there's sort of a, a there's a couple of different sort of philosophical points that sort of like flow through this, and one of them is exactly that, that that the Dennis Trace's domain really should be K theory of endomorphisms. Um, absolutely, yes, for sure. That is something that got lost in this, um, but I absolutely agree. It should totally be there. Um, and that is, yeah, that is part of the philosophy here, um, that you really want it to be that. And I mean, another question, um, this should also relate to zeta functions somehow. Exactly, yes, exactly, yes, yes. And so that was the thing that I put in the title and then got cut from the actual talk, which I felt sort of guilty about. Um, but yeah, so we're thinking about, we're taking our values in TR, we're actually thinking about those as sort of getting us at zeta functions for sure. Like, absolutely. Yes, yes, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. I don't have anything specific to say about it, given where I sort of took this talk, um, but yeah, absolutely. All right, well, um, any other questions? Okay, well, if, if not, we'll break for, I, I guess, about 20 minutes. And let's thank Kate again for the beautiful talk.